down memory lane, if that'd be okay. Uh, that's sort of what old people like to do. We like to reminisce about the past. But I, I remember a day uh, in my life that occurred a little over 11 years ago, and I remember it very, very vividly uh, because it was a day like no other, and it was a day like none other have been since. It, it was May 22nd, 2004, all right? And that day was my wedding day. I am that old, yes. <laughs> and that day was a day that I saw Laura, my wife, as I had never seen her before. We had known each other for a little over two years. We had had a lot of conversations. We had had the conversation, you know, the defining their relationship thing. Um, it actually took two days for us to figure that out. Um, and eventually I wore her down and she said yes. Um, <laughs> We dated, we became engaged, we knew each other very well, but on that day, I saw her like I had never saw her before. Something was different, because on that day, she was a bride, and she looked different than she had ever looked before. And contrary to all logic, she was not just a bride, she was my bride, all right? I stand as hope for all single men, all right? If God can do it for me, he can do it for you, I promise. And uh, so this is uh, my bride and I on our wedding day. And uh, one, of my, one of my good friends in, uh, that I, in, in graduate school, um, he said that the greatest argument for the existence of God is, is that Laura married Dan. So... <laughs> So we know definitively that, that God exists, and um, I'm so thankful for my wife. On that day, on May 22nd, 2004, uh, as we gathered for our wedding ceremony, we gathered to enter a covenant relationship with one another. We invited our family, our friends, and ultimately God to come and witness some vows that we were going to make to each other. And among some of the things that, that we promised to each other, uh, we promised that we would now forsake all other lovers. That we would reserve our love only for each other until one of us died. Until death do us part. We made a pledge. We entered a covenant agreement. This week, we're talking about understanding and embracing our identity in Christ, becoming who we are, who Jesus Christ has made us to be, who he saved us to be. And embracing and understanding your identity is so critical to living out the life that God's called you to live. And so this morning, as we continue that, I want us to think about our identity as a bride. Now, now, guys, I understand this is going to be a little bit harder for you than for the ladies, all right? But you're just going to have to work with me here, all right? Because the Bible says that in Christ, we become part of the bride of Christ. We become his bride. And God often has used wedding imagery in the picture of the marriage relationship to symbolize his relationship with his people, both in Israel and the Old Testament, as well as with the church. And so marriage is something that is of incredible importance to God, not just because it's the foundational cultural institution that he created right before God created anything else. He created the family right before he created any other human institution. Right? It's very important to God, and it's important to God not only because it's a foundation for society, but because it pictures the covenant relationship that he offers with his people. So I want us to think about and embrace this idea of being a bride. Guys, like I said, I know it's hard. Ladies, girls, how many of you are already sort of, you know, you just say, yeah, sometimes I daydream about what my wedding might be like. Any wedding daydreamers? All right. My little girl started early with that. When she was two years old, we had, I, I performed two pretty big weddings and she became in love with them. Uh, this picture is from when she was three, actually. And uh, we've had a lot of weddings in our house and she generally marries um, buddy bear. So she's married him many times. Um, <laughs> we're working on that part. Um, one day uh, we sort of had a pretty big wedding. You know, I walked her down the aisle and then I turned around and did the ceremony. And um, the next day she said, Daddy, Daddy, I want to have a wedding today. And I said, Didn't you get married yesterday? And she said, Yeah, but we, we're unmarried now. <laughs> and so um, we, we still have a little work to do, but 
We have had a lot of weddings, and uh, she, uh, even at age in two and three, would talk about her wedding down to the details of the cake, the dancing, everything. So um, she's probably not Baptist, but anyway. <laughs> It's an amazing, amazing thought to think of ourselves as the bride of Christ. I want to begin this morning uh, in Ephesians chapter 5. We'll look at a few passages this morning as we we do most days. But Ephesians chapter 5, Paul's writing to the church. and He's writing about marriage, about the marriage relationship. He he makes a very strong point that the marriage relationship is, is something greater than just two people loving each other. All right, that that marriage isn't just about two people loving each other, that it's a beautiful and incredible picture of God's relationship with us. And so Paul writes and he says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish but holy and blameless. Now look down at verse 31. For this reason a man will leave his father and his mother and become united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery but I am talking about Christ and the church. And so in this passage, as Paul exhorts husbands to love their wives just as Christ loved the church, to give themselves up on behalf of their spouse, on behalf of their wife. Why? Because marriage is a picture of God's relationship with us and God's incredible love for us and how he sees us. And so marriage then becomes this incredibly important covenantal institution that isn't just about us. It's about God. He created and designed it and he designed it to be the foundation and the fabric of society. But he also designed it to be a picture of his incredible love relationship with us. And look what it says there. He says that Christ gave himself up for his bride. Right, Jesus Christ willingly went to the cross for you and for me. He willingly laid down his life and endured the wrath and the horror and the agony and the humiliation of the cross. Why? So that he could pay for our sin and so that he could become our bridegroom, that we could become his bride. He said to present her, the church, that's every single person who comes to faith in Jesus Christ. We become part of God's church, part of his body, part of his family. And he says he did that to present her to himself as a radiant church, as a radiant bride. He says without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, perfect, holy, and blameless. In verse 32, he says, it's a mystery. It's hard to understand, but he says, I'm talking about Christ in the church. And so, Paul exhorts men to love their brides because Christ loved the church. And God has made us to be his bride. He's brought us into a covenantal relationship with him through Jesus Christ. The night before Jesus died, I'm just going to give you the reference there. We're not going to necessarily turn there. You can write down the reference if you want to read this. It's a familiar passage. It's part of what we would call the Last Supper, right? When Jesus shared a a Passover meal, a very important Passover meal with his disciples the night before he went to the cross. And, And that night he inaugurated the new covenant that he was about to make, the new arrangement between God and man, right? Because the old covenant, man could not keep his end. The nation of Israel always failed to keep their end of the covenant that God had made with them. So God had promised that he would make a new covenant with them. And the new covenant was being inaugurated this night. And and it says in uh, verse 20 in Luke chapter 22, it says Jesus is talking about the bread and he took a piece of bread from the Passover meal, the third piece of bread that was passed in the meal. And he, and he, and he took it and he said, this bread now it symbolizes, it's representing my body which is going to be broken for you. And then he took the cup and there were four cups in the Passover meal and it was, this was the third one. And, and he, it was the cup of judgment. And he took that cup and he says, this cup is poured out for you and it is the new covenant in my blood. The Passover meal, which looked back to what God had done for the nation of Israel, for the people of God when they were in Egypt, when God passed over them in judgment, was not just 
a meal that looked back, but it was a meal that looked forward because Jesus is the Passover lamb. He came to be the ultimate once and for all sacrifice for sin. And he came to inaugurate a new arrangement, a new agreement between God and man. And now in this new agreement, God writes his law and his love into our hearts. And when we come and enter into a covenant relationship with God by faith, right, through the gospel, through our belief that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sin, that he rose from the dead, when we come to faith in Christ alone, we enter a covenant relationship with God. Sons and daughters of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, we become priests to our God because Jesus Christ is our high priest and we become the bride of Christ. We have a new identity and knowing that Understanding that, embracing that should change and transform the way that we live. God wants us to see ourselves the way he sees us. God wants you to see yourself the way he sees you. Because when you see yourself the way he sees you, when you believe what he says about you, it will affect and change the way that you behave. Because behavior always flows out of belief. Are you with me? Behavior. We always act in accordance to what we believe. Whether we're willing to admit it or not, behavior always comes from belief. Behavior flows out of belief. When we get married as human beings, you're not there yet. One day, hopefully you will be. But it changes the way that you live. right? It changes your life very, very drastically. You used to be one, now one person just by yourself, but now you have been attached to another and the Bible says two become one and so life is different. You make decisions differently. You have to work through things differently. Life is different. It's really good, but it's really different. And just as though when we enter the marriage relationship, life is different. When we enter a covenant relationship with God by faith through Jesus Christ, life becomes different. It changes our life. It changes who we are. It changes how we live. It changes everything about us. Just as when we got married, my wife had to change her name, right? As a symbol that two lives have become one. Her last name, her maiden name was Davies. All right? Mine is Davis. She had said when she was younger she would never, never marry a Davis. All right? Because she thought Davies were better than Davis. All right? But God works all things out. I convinced her. And she's now a Davis. All right? She changed her name. Right? Two had become one. And when you come in to, to know Christ as your Savior, right? God changes your name. He changes your label. Right? You're not who you used to be. Your label is not sinner anymore. Your label is not failure. Your label is not separated from God. But your label is child, priest, bride. You have a new identity and a new relationship with God and a new perspective and a new relationship on sin. All right. Be before we come to know Christ, we sin because it's who we are, right? We, it's, it's our nature. We don't have the restraining power of the Spirit living in us. We don't know Christ in our heart. We don't even have the capacity to honor God and to obey Him. But once we come into a living relationship with God, we now have the ability to live for God. And we now have the ability to look at sin and deal with sin differently. Now, as believers, we still struggle with sin still sometimes say things we wish we didn't say. We do things we wish we didn't do, right? There's those times where we sin and, and we didn't mean to, right? Are you with me? We just, we just did it and we, we realize it and, and, and we're sorry and we confess it. But then there's times as believers that we plan to sin. I mean, we make arrangements to sin. And that should not be if we are followers of Christ, if we see ourselves the way we are. We have a new relationship with sin. We should now understand the horror of sin. Right? When we look at the cross and we look at what Jesus endured, we're looking at the consequences of sin. You see, sin is something so much more than just disobeying God. Sin is so much more than just disobeying God. Sin is not just something you do or you don't do. It's not just an action or an inaction. It's not just a choice. All right, sin is powerful. Why? Sin is rebellion against God. Sin is rebellion against God. Sin is saying, God, I don't want to do your will. God, I don't want to live under your authority. I don't want to recognize you as my king. 
I want to be king of my own life. I want to do it my way. Sin is rebellion against God. Sin is powerful. I've said this many times. I've heard it many times. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you want to pay. Sin is not a pet to be tamed, but a dragon to be slayed. Sin brings bondage into our lives. Listen, apart from Christ and his redemption, we're all slaves to sin. All right, sin never brings freedom. Sin never, ever, ever leads us towards freedom, even though we sometimes think that it will. Right? In our minds, sometimes we think that breaking the rules will make me free. Have you ever felt like that? All right? Have you ever, you know, just thought, if I could just break some of these rules, I would be freer. I, I want to be free. And there's something within us that thinks breaking the rules will bring freedom. And when it comes to our relationship with God and the instructions, the law that he's given us to live under, not because we have to, but because we can, right, through the new covenant, this new agreement we have with God, we have to realize that sin is not the pathway to freedom, but following and trusting and obeying Christ is actually the pathway to freedom. The gospel is an invitation to be somebody that you never were. Right? The gospel is an invitation to be somebody that you never were. Right? You, through Jesus Christ, are now a child of God. You're a priest to your God. And you are the bride of Christ. And I want you this morning to be able to picture yourself that way. Because here's what I know and believe. That when we see ourselves the way God sees us, it will change the way that we look at sin. And it will change our heart attitude about our tendency towards rebellion. You are the bride of Christ. And as the bride of Christ, God calls you to be faithful to your bridegroom. He calls you to be faithful to your bridegroom. When, when people get married and they pledge to forsake all others and to be faithful only to each other, I believe most everyone really means that. But for whatever reason, not everyone honors that vow. For whatever reason, not everyone keeps that covenant agreement with their spouse. That they may be for their family, their friends, and before God. Why is that? Well, there could be a lot of reasons. But ultimately it's this. They buy into a lie that there's a satisfaction that they're missing out on. And that their agreement that they've made is somehow restricting their life. And so they believe there's something out there better than what they have. And here's the thing. Sin is so deceptive. Right? Sin looks so amazing at first. Solomon put it like this in Proverbs chapter 20 verse 17. He said, stolen bread tastes sweet. Listen, there is pleasure in sin for a season, the Bible says. Right? Sin can feel really good. It can feel absolutely intoxicating. It can feel amazing in the moment, no doubt. It's one of the reasons why it's so alluring, so, so tempting. But Solomon says, stolen bread tastes sweet. It tastes amazing. I want you to just imagine the most amazing bread that you, any bread, and now if you're gluten intolerant, I'm sorry, but it, just for you that aren't, how many of you just, you love bread, all right? <laughs> wow, I do too. All right, and the smell of fresh baked bread, isn't it amazing? All right, and, and then you, you smear some butter on it, right? And mm, you with me? All right, all right, come back. I didn't mean for you to get that lost in the bread experience. <laughs> but it's amazing. It's, it's, it's just wonderful. Have you ever had dirt in your mouth? As amazing and wonderful as that warm, delicious, buttery bread was, having dirt in your mouth is about exactly the opposite, isn't it? It's horrible. It's, there's nothing pleasant about it. The taste isn't pleasant. The texture isn't pleasant. It's terrible. And that's exactly what Solomon says sin is like. It, it, it starts out deceptively amazing, but afterwards it turns to gravel in your mouth. In the end, no one ever says, wow, my adultery was so fulfilling. Oh, 
My decision to cheat on my spouse, well, it was the best decision that I ever made. It brought so much freedom into my life. It brought so much joy into my life. I'm so glad that I did that. No, it, it, it never, ever works out like that. Instead, there's always sorrow and pain and hurt and destruction. Maybe you yourself know that pain. Maybe it's occurred in your family and you know personally all too well the pain and the destruction and the hurt that that sin has brought into your life or your family's life. Sin is more powerful than we acknowledge. It's more evil than we admit and it's destruction worse than we imagine. It's never worth it. The payout's always less than the cost. And we can all agree on that. But here's the thing. As believers in Christ, as his children, as his priest, as his bride, when we willingly choose to sin, we're committing spiritual adultery. Unfaithful to our God. We're choosing to rebel against him. And it always leads to pain. Why? Sin promises freedom. But it brings slavery. It promises joy. But it brings sorrow. And when we seek satisfaction and fulfillment from something other than the God of the universe, we're committing unfaithfulness. I think all the way back to Adam and Eve. Right? The very first two human beings. God created them. He made them. He fashioned them in his likeness. He gave them the capacity to know him and enjoy him. He placed them in a place called Eden. A place of perfect enjoyment and delight. He says, this is for you to enjoy. They enjoyed a relationship with God. He would come and meet with them and walk with them. And he says, there's just one rule. All right? The Garden of Eden was not like Chehi. There was only one rule. <laughs> one rule. Wouldn't that be great? But here's the problem. Even though there was only one rule, what happened? They broke the one rule. Right? The one rule. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For if you do, you will what? surely die. But eventually, through the temptation of Satan, they came to a place where they thought, maybe God didn't really mean what he said. And not only did they believe that, they thought, maybe God is holding out on us. Right? He, yeah, he gave us this amazing and beautiful place, and he comes and walks with us in the cool of the, the night and the evening, but there's, there's probably something he's, he's holding back on us. This tree will make us wise. It will make us like God. There's a satisfaction that we're missing out on. That we have to have. And so they eventually believed that what they desired, they needed, and what they wanted, they had to have. And so they took it and they ate it. And you know the story all too well. It was so less satisfying than they could have ever imagined, wasn't it? What they thought would bring a new level of freedom brought the ultimate destruction into their lives. It brought rebellion into their hearts. It brought loss of their closeness with God. It made them forfeit the delights of Eden. And ultimately, it brought death into their lives and into their human experience. It brought death into their family. As one day, their son Cain would murder their son Abel. Right? Sin has devastating consequences because sin is not just something we do or we don't do. It's rebellion against God. It's evil. Its source is Satan. It's powerful spiritually. And so we realize that our rebellion is serious. It's so less satisfying than we think. And it ends up crushing us. And it's always that way. Look in Jeremiah chapter 2 with me. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 12 and verse 13. And the prophet Jeremiah sharing the words of God with the people of God who were rebelling against him. And he said, Be appalled at this, O heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord, for my people have committed two sins. Two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and they have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns, that cannot hold water. And this is a very powerful image that the people of Israel would have heard and understand very clearly. Because there's two main ways that they got water in their day. They either got water from a spring that filled up a, a well or a pool and it would bubble up from the ground, right? And some of you are you're familiar with spring water. It's fresh, it's clean, right? It's, it's cold, it's refreshing. 
Or they would dig wells, they would dig cisterns that would collect rainwater during the rainy season and that water would have to hold them through the dry times. Now, you can sort of imagine what a stagnant pool of water would be like after a period of time. Are you with me? Right? The algae starts to grow on it, the slime. You know, you go to get a drink and you gotta kinda have to weed through the, the things growing in there. So if you had a choice between a living well, a living fountain of water, or a cistern, which would you choose? It shouldn't be that hard. Which one would you choose? Spring. All right, thank you. You shouldn't have to think, a living spring, mm, uh, some amoebas in my water, no thank you, all right? <laughs> But the prophet, he says what? He says, not only have you, fors you, he says, you forsaken the springs of living water, you've turned away from them, and you've dug for yourself cisterns, but they're, they're not even, they can't even hold the nasty rainwater. They're cracked and dry. And it's a picture of what happens when we forsake God and His ways and chase after the rebellion of our hearts. It always is unsatisfying. It's dry and it's empty. And I want to ask you to think about yourself this morning. How do you see yourself? How do, how do you look at yourself? Do you see yourself as the bride of Christ? Maybe it's something you've never thought about this before this morning. Maybe it's something that's never been presented to you. But this morning, I want you to consider and to think with me that you are the bride of of Christ. It's who you are. It's who God has made you to be. And as such, God wants you to live as his pure bride. And so I want to ask you this morning, is there an area of rebellion in your life? Uh, listen, it's not fun to have to deal with our sin, but I want you to know that God has brought you to a place where you can. And if there's rebellion in your heart, you're being unfaithful to your bridegroom. You are his bride, dressed in white, declared righteous and pure and holy by your Savior. He is faithful to you. Are you faithful to him? Have you forsaken the living water that's Christ? Maybe you've dug some cisterns in your life. You've dug some wells that you thought would be satisfying, that you thought would fulfill you. Maybe you never really intended to dig it, but... All of a sudden, you were there with a the shovel in your hand, not even sure how it got there. You weren't planning to dig very far, but you started digging a little bit and digging some more, and you find yourself deeper than you can imagine. And here's the thing I want you to know this morning. Right? God still loves you. Your bridegroom paid for your sin, past, present, and future. And when he chose to enter a covenant relationship with you by offering his grace to you through salvation, he knew everything about you, past, present and future and he still chose you he still calls you his bride he still sees you as pure and he wants you to return to him you're in a safe place to do that when we confess our sin before God he promises that he will forgive us we can come back to him there's no rebellion in our heart that he will not forgive he's waiting to forgive you he's your father he's rooting for you and he wants you to come home to him. You're in a perfect place to take what's buried in the darkness and bring it into the light. You have counselors that love you and care about you. You can talk to them. You have faculty that love you and care about you. You can talk to them. You can come and talk to me. You can come and talk to Mr. Haynes. Anyone that you feel comfortable and say, you know what, there is some rebellion in my life. There's some things that I know aren't pleasing to God, but I want to deal with that. Why is it important to do that? Because we confess it to God, but when we confess it to one another, as the Bible says, we bring our sin into the light. And it breaks the power. Your bridegroom paid for your sin. He loves you. And he's waiting for you to come back to him. And to be faithful to him. And he will not only ask you to do that. He'll help you to do that through the power of your spirit. Would you bow your heads in prayer? Would you for this, this brief moment just picture yourself dressed in white. As a glorious and radiant bride. That's how Jesus sees you. Are you living that way? Are you living as his bride? Are you seeking to find your delight and your satisfaction in him and in him alone? Everything else is a dry cistern that will never fulfill you. It will never give you what you long for. Only Jesus can. And if that's you today, God invites you to return, to come back to him. He will take you and embrace you. He loves you. 
Ask him to forgive you. Deal with that sin. Deal with that rebellion. Confess it before your father. And deal, confess it to someone else that they might be able to encourage you, challenge you, help you. Let God work. Father, we pray this morning that, that you would help us to see ourselves as you see us, as your glorious bride. And Father, may we let our identity shape how we live. Father, the temptation to sin is great. And Father, you will not always take that temptation away, but you will always make a way for us to obey you through the power of your Spirit. Father, for those who have dug cisterns in their life that are cracked and dry, Father, may you lift them out May they come to repentance and may they be restored to the joy that is found in loving you and living as your bride. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.